The empty tomb, we have it all, ironclad, guaranteed. I tell people the tomb was left empty so that your life could be made full. This week on Christian World News, evidence for the resurrection. Scientists, scholars, and even a detective make the case that Christ did indeed rise from the dead. Plus, it's known as the Good Friday Miracle. A Navy jet crashes into an apartment complex and no one is killed or even badly injured. Here are the amazing stories of survival. And a new star emerges from the White House. See how the Pence family's pet bunny is helping others and why it's coming under attack. <목소리도> 여러분 안녕하십니까? 크리스천 월드 뉴스입니다. 두 명의 무신론자가 예수 그리스도 부활의 증거를 찾아 나섰습니다. 부활이라는 것이 없다라는 것을 증명하기 위함이었다고 하는데요. 하지만 이들이 마주한 결과는 전혀 예상치 못했던 것이었습니다. 오늘의 첫 소식입니다. As a successful cold case detective, Jay Warner Wallace became so well known at solving decades old murders, he ended up as the foremost expert on national TV true crime shows. Wallace was also an atheist and decided to turn his superior detective skills to disproving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Or maybe even proving it if the evidence took him there. And I'm going to have to figure out how to evaluate that for its truthfulness, given the skill set that I had as a cold case detective. CBN News talked to him at a crowded conference where many hundreds gathered to hear Wallace tell his story and learn how their faith in Christ rests on solid evidence. For years, some doubters clung to one theory that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but was just nearly dead and revived later. Wallace points out when you work with dead bodies all the time, like he has, and people in Christ's time did, you can definitely tell dead from nearly dead. Hot blood's going to stop circulating. You're going to cool down. That's called algor mortis, and that's that you'll be cool to the touch. And we can actually judge time of death based on how cool. And I've seen this my entire career. There's a thing called rigor mortis, and you won't be as as flexible as you would be if you were just unconscious. And Warner finds in the Book of John a key point of proof: a line about blood and water coming out of Jesus' body on the cross when a Roman soldier pierced him with a spear. Water will collect in your lungs. Now, if that happens and you pierce that cavity, you're going to see a separation of blood and water. It struck Wallace. Powerfully, that John wrote of this. He's either so clever that he included some little known biological fact that nobody would discover for 1800 years, or he just reported what he saw. And as a result, uh, we have a good piece of hidden science that confirms that Jesus actually died of cardiac arrest on that cross and was dead at the point of taking the body off the cross. The Renaissance said, We don't need God. Why? See how great man, woman is. As an atheist, Josh McDowell set off to write everything that demands a verdict to show the evidence about Christ, including his resurrection, was so weak the verdict would be not true. The resurrection was one of several things I knew I had to refute as a non believer. But instead of refuting, he became so convinced it happened, he spends dozens of pages knocking down false theories, such as Christ didn't really die, but woke up and escaped from the tomb. There were a hundred and some pounds encasement of aromatic spices and gummy cement consistency around his body, wrapped tightly in three separate linen cloths, weighing about 117 pounds encased in that, and it becomes hardened. Second, how would he be able to move in such a state like that, move a one and a half to two ton stone away from the entrance? As for the idea that after the crucifixion, the disciples stole Christ's body, well, the Jewish leaders opposed to Jesus were so afraid of that very thing happening, they talked the Romans into posting a massive guard group, probably 16 soldiers outside Christ's tomb. So McDowell scoffs at the idea the disciples could have pulled off such a heist. The impossibility of that that they could have climbed through there, tiptoed around all the guards, and become uh, invisible to the guards in front of the tomb, roll one after two ton stone, that at day day they said that 20 men couldn't move it. Wallace can't accept this was all just a conspiracy because detectives know those often fall apart when the people involved face real threats if they don't recant. And we don't have a single ancient record of any of the disciples ever recanting when that was often the goal of the people who were persecuting Christians. Wallace points out courts don't expect the law to prove no possible doubt, only no reasonable doubt. So is it possible that they conspired for 60 years at 500 plus people under immense pressure with not enough family relationships to hold it together? Yeah, it's possible. It's just not reasonable. 
Remember, too, all the early believers were fervent Jews who faced dire danger if they broke the Sabbath. Alex McFarland, who organized this conference, points out how that changed right after Jesus' resurrection. Pious Jews whose very relationship with God is contingent on keeping a Sabbath that they've observed for centuries suddenly, overnight, begin to worship on Sunday. Why? Something must have happened. Sunday was Resurrection Day. Now, you have to understand what it meant to the Jew if they ever broke the Sabbath. It could mean death. In the empty tomb, we have it all, ironclad, guaranteed. I tell people the tomb was left empty so that your life could be made full. It gives me hope that as Christ was raised to the dead, I shall be too because of that. If Christ physically rose from the grave, then uh, that proves his identity, message, and, and credentials. What, what was his identity? God incarnate. What was his message? Salvation by faith in, in what he did on the cross. His credentials, virgin-born, sinless life rose from the dead, i.e., he is the Savior. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the Truth for a New Generation Conference, Greensboro, North Carolina. 6년 전이죠. 성 금요일에 해군 전투기가 아파트에 충돌하는 사고가 발생했습니다. 미국 버지니아의 주거 지역에서 일어난 사고였는데요. 그런데 놀랍게도 사망자나 부상자는 단한 명도 없었다고 합니다. 많은 이들이 이를 부활절의 기적이라 부르며 이날을 기념하고 있다고 하는데요. 함께 만나보시죠. It was Good Friday, a little past noon. School had just been let out for Easter break in Virginia Beach, Virginia, when something completely unexpected happened. The, the air started vibrating. I just heard a loud noise and went chicka boom boom boom. There was all this black stuff, I mean like heavy dark black smoke just going by the window. I'm like, my God, no, no, no. I'm just screaming, no, no, no. It was an F-A-18D Hornet that had malfunctioned right after takeoff from the nearby Oceana Naval Air Station. It slammed into the Mayfair Muse apartment complex in a highly populated residential neighborhood. Virginia Beach 911, where's the emergency? Uh, any plane just went down off of 24th Street. The, the apartment building is completely destroyed. Oh my God, it's, it's like, it's, just, it's terrible. The whole thing is on fire and it's a senior community. Oh my God, all those old people. Oh my God. Oh my Jesus. The jet's two-man crew ejected just 50 feet above ground. Saw the pilot laying on the ground here, on his sides, hands in the air, white as a sheet. He was still connected to his parachute, which was connected to the roof of this building here. We had to cut the lines, get him free of the parachute, but a bunch of us picked him up, dragged him to the front parking lot area, away from the flames. The heavy black thick smoke started to come over the rooftop here. And I knew we had a matter of minutes before it's, the fire was going to come this way. As the ominous black smoke rose from the crash site and countless emergency responders ran to the scene, everyone expected the worst. I saw it go in and I thought, oh gosh, they're all dead. And I looked back at the buildings and I just counted the people that were had perished. Because I'm, I'm here every day, I'm retired, I don't go anywhere. I got to the front and I looked, they're dead, and they're passed away, and she's gone. Mayor Will Sessoms of Virginia Beach feared the same. When I came over here, about right where we were standing, there was a massive fire still going on. There were buildings over to my right that were pretty well demolished. Earl Moyer was manager of the Mayfair Muse at the time. He was heading out of town when he heard about the crash. He'd already been praying for his tenants for 11 years, so he immediately turned to God. I knew whether there were casualties or not that he needed to be there, so I just prayed that he would be there. You know, I didn't, all I could do is think of people suffering, burning, and, and I just wanted him to be there on this scene to, you know, just to comfort people. Earl began searching for his tenants and was able to locate all but four, so he continued to pray. And the next day, the four missing persons were located alive. And one by one, others started sharing their miraculous stories of survival. Ben Dishner lived and worked at the Mayfair Muse before the Navy jet destroyed his home. There's no earthly reason for me to be standing here talking to you today. 
I take my lunch religiously at 11.30 to 12.30 every day. And by all rights, I should have been in my house playing computer games, uh, but uh, God told me to set some more tile. I'm like, well, it's like five minutes till 12. I'm past lunch. You know, I'm gonna go to lunch. And something said, no, nah, just, just set these eight more tiles. Set these eight more tiles. Eight more tiles say, well, I say eight more tiles save my life, but God saved my life. The jet crashed through Ben's apartment window and set his place on fire, but his life was spared, as were his wife's and his father-in-law's lives. We had to take him to the hospital a couple months before. He had some complications and had to go to rehab. If he hadn't have went to rehab, he would have been home. Uh, a week before the crash, they changed my wife's schedule. If they hadn't changed her schedule, she'd have been sitting on the couch when the plane came through the front window. Sandy Hall would normally have been home when the jet crashed as well, but her plans changed at the last minute on that Friday morning, saving her life too. I have a cleaning business and my client had texted me and asked me to come later being it was Good Friday and her son was home from school. So I texted her back and said, how about around 10? She said, perfect. So I left here at about 20 to 10 instead of leaving here at 8 o'clock like I normally do. And normally I'm home by noon. Well, it was about 12.30, quarter to 1 when I got the phone call at work that a jet had crashed. While Sandy was out, her apartment and everything in it went up in flames. But even people that were home made it out safely. Cheryl McKee owns a pet supply store right next to the Mayfair Muse. I actually watched a man walk out of the apartment that the plane went in. He came out the front door, the plane went down the back, and he came out and didn't really realize something had happened. Linda Warnick was in her second story apartment with her grandchildren Egan and Haven when the jet made impact. But they too made it through their front door without a scratch. People across in the other townhouses told us that the heat was so intense that they couldn't come out their front doors. They went out the back doors. I didn't even feel nothing. I didn't even feel the flames. Me either. It was it, it, it kind of like God protected us. Guess what? So I felt God just around me, hugging me. And since the jet was fully fueled when it crashed, the point of contact was critical. With God uh, honoring my prayers, I think, he put that thing in the most perfect spot. It kind of like he just kind of dropped it in this cove here to, you know, stop the explosion from going even further or debris. When you place God on the scene, be prepared for a miracle. God definitely was on the scene that day because otherwise, if it went a few feet further, we wouldn't be here to tell the story. You know, and it definitely makes you think that you might not be thinking of God, but He's right there all the time thinking about you. What else kept me from being in my home that day? What else kept me, kept anybody from being hurt? Not even the pilots. God had His hand all around this. 마이크 펜스 미국 부통령이 키우는 애완토끼가 화제입니다. 말론 번도 펜스라는 이름을 갖고 있다고 하는데요. 그런데 평범한 토끼가 아니라고 합니다. 기금 마련을 돕고 있다고 하는데요. 함께 만나보시죠. Moment he hopped on the scene. This is Marlon Bundo. The second bunny, Marlon Bundo, has been a star on the rise. People kind of got a kick out of it that we had a bunny at all, and then we brought a bunny to D.C. With 20,000 Instagram followers and a growing fan base, Marlon Bundo did what any celebrity would do. He wrote a book. Sort of. The vice president's daughter, Charlotte, is the author behind Marlon Bundo's A Day in the Life of the Vice President. And second lady Karen Pence did the illustrations. We thought, you know, it'd be really fun to do a children's book um, that also educated kids on the role of the vice presidency. But this isn't just a book about a bunny hopping around following the Veep. 
A portion of the sales goes to causes near and dear to the Pence women, like Riley Children's Hospital and Tracy's Kids. Tracy's Kids, I've been on the board there for many years, and uh, I first got involved when I found out there was something called art therapy, I'm excited which to start this uh, campaign affected children with cancer so much so that they would ask their parents, when do I get to go back to the hospital? Mrs. Pence says she's seen this particular type of healing all over the world. So from children to, to veterans. It's not arts and crafts. It's not like getting your paints out and feeling good after you paint. These are actually therapists who guide you through the art making process to actually bring some of the emotions and struggles and trauma that you're dealing with to the surface. The book also carries a deeper meaning for Charlotte. It supports A21, a nonprofit fighting against human trafficking. They have a lot of resources for people um, and resources for teachers to help teach people about the signs of human trafficking and how to notice it and recognize it so you can report it and then they have information on how you can report it um, and through those efforts they've rescued um, I mean tons of people who have been in these terrible situations and then they help them afterwards. Evangelist Christine Kane started A21 with the mission to abolish slavery everywhere. They're certainly spreading the word with operations in 12 different countries, including the U.S. This Marlon Bundle book isn't to be confused with others. Comedian John Oliver released a parody on the book at the same time as The Pences, as a criticism to the vice president's socially conservative stance. His book raises money for The Trevor Project, a charity dedicated to suicide prevention in LGBTQ youth. There are no hard feelings, though. Charlotte says she bought a copy of that book, too. Beyond raising money for charity, Mrs. Pence, an educator of 25 years, hopes the book teaches children about civics, too. Just like the vice president, Marlon Bundo's day begins here at the Naval Observatory. Then he heads over to Capitol Hill while the vice president presides over the Senate. The book is full of educational nuggets, and the Pence women say they planned it that way. At the back of the book, we listed several fun facts about the vice presidency or the Naval Observatory or other vice presidents. Marlin and the vice president end their day with scripture, an addition important to the second family. His faith is really central to his, his life, and we didn't think it would really be a fair thing to leave it out. It's just a part of who he is and who we are. Beyond teaching the children about the vice presidential duties, they hope this story helps educate people on the dangers of human trafficking and the power of healing through the arts. Amber Strong, CBN News at the Naval Observatory. Washington's one school has changed the art of art. What is the story? Let's look at the screen. It's one building that's hard to miss. And you can see it from, you know, 395 from the highway. I mean, that highway uh, sees 175,000 cars a day. Odds are that drive-by audience will lead to a new attention for this former church's new life as a true work of art, a hidden gem in the heart of Washington, D.C. The ability to revive that and still keep the same themes of a church, which is, you know, really a community center. Built in 18 1986, Friendship Baptist Church outgrew the chapel, put up the property for sale, and moved to a new building just down the street. For years, it remained vacant. That is, until 2012, when an idea blossomed. These are cherry blossoms, right? These are cherry blossoms, and we are inside. Allowing it to transform into a space for the arts and culture community. Right now, we're on the balcony of what used to be a church, and to put things into perspective, take a look. This is where the congregation used to sit. Imagine some rows of pews, the pastor up front. It's now a very large space for activities. Even the piano has been fine-tuned into modern art. We caught up with Atlanta-based artist Alex Brewer, who spent nearly a month just painting the outside of 700 Delaware Avenue Southwest. Was it a challenge to paint something this large, a church? Yeah, because it was a three-dimensional uh, piece of architecture, uh, I wanted to kind of give it a sculptural feel uh, by wrapping the entire thing and by 
uh, continuing the patterns and the colors. There isn't an area that wasn't touched with paint or some type of creative content uh, or character. And that's, again, that, that's something that no other space can really offer. And that creativity attracts tourists inside to take a closer look. You're just visiting or? Oh yeah, okay, we'll get your, get your walk on. All right, please. For 131 years, people have been walking inside this church to pray, worship, and now can still appreciate creation. To be able to share that story of not just what we've done, but what the church congregation before us has done. Ben Kennedy, CBN News, Washington. 크리스천 월드뉴스 오늘 준비한 소식은 여기까지입니다. 저는 다음 주에 다시 인사드리겠습니다. 시청해주신 여러분 고맙습니다.